today we're going to be looking at a discipline that, I mean, the last couple of weeks we looked at prayer last week and uh, John did a wonderful job going through the Lord's Prayer. And as he started, I'm thinking he's doing the Lord's Prayer in one week. That is adventurous, uh, but smashed it, did a really, really good job. Help us understand what it looks like to go to a God who is sovereign and saving and satisfying. Man, it was wonderful. Uh, the week before we looked at what does it look like to have uh, a to have a mindset on things that are above, and today we're continuing in that mindset a little bit as we're looking at something that is often uh, I would say either misunderstood or avoided, or maybe even it, it sounds controversial to say we're going to be talking about meditation. What to say meditation? Uh, the Bible talks about meditation a lot. So for example, where the psalmist says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. Or he says later, Psalm 119, I will meditate on your precepts and fix your eyes on, my, on your ways. Or even as we just heard from Deuteronomy and Jesus um, reaffirms the Shema where he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. How do we do that? That's what we're looking at today. We're talking about meditation. Some of you might think, oh, meditation, that sounds like, like an Eastern philosophy thing. So we're just going to kind of shelve it over there because that's spooky or spiritual or doesn't sound very Christian. Uh, but it is, well, meditation at least, is very Christian as we're exampled and we're instructed to do this very thing. So what I do is today, in a, in a not too uh, protracted time, I'm going to look at the Scriptures, help us understand what is meditation, what isn't it. So if we have some misunderstandings around what that is, how we are to engage in it, and how it's amazingly beneficial for us as people who belong to Jesus, who worship Jesus. Uh, so let's pray and then we'll get stuck into some more Scripture. And so Father, I want to thank you today for your Scriptures. Thank you for helping us to be able to understand more of who you are, more of your character, more of your work in the world, your creative work, your sustaining work, your saving work. And so help us today to have uh, an open mind, but also a mind fixed on you. We, like we looked at a couple weeks ago, we want to have our minds set on the things that are from above. And so as we're looking at meditation today, help us to echo the psalmist that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so just, I know it's summer. Some of you have had a lot of sun this week. Some of you might have had a late night last night. We've had two weddings in the church this week. Uh, so many of you, you know, might have had a big week of celebration. You might be all peopled out. Let me just give you the headline, what meditation isn't and what it is. Meditation from a Christian perspective, as we look through the Scriptures, when we see the word meditate, what we're not talking about is emptying your mind. That's not meditation from a scriptural or Christian perspective. It's not going up on a hill and trying to empty your mind. Come on with the universe. That's not what the Scriptures are talking about when they say meditation. So if you have that concept of meditation in your mind and then you read in the Scriptures, meditate, and you think that doesn't sound right, I'm just not going to meditate. We just need to get a better understanding about what the Scripture actually means when it talks about meditating. The spiritual discipline, oh sorry, meditation is the how of the discipline, spiritual discipline of loving the Lord your God with all your mind. It is one of the ways in which we love the Lord our God with all of our mind. How do you love the Lord your God with all your mind? What is the mind? How do we meditate? What does that even mean? What does that look like? Uh, with the mind, <clears throat> I promise we're going to get into Scripture very soon. Mind is very complicated. Uh, I've been listening a lot this week. Very famous philosophers and scientists from different fields uh, different specialities, and 0% of them are confident to say this is what the mind truly is. Uh, it is non-corporeal, immaterial, non-biological, but at the same time, not distinct from your biology. Your mind 
affects your body. And uh, some of the research that I was reading, I didn't do the research, I was reading people's research this week, looking at how our mind affects our body, but also how our bodies affect our mind. So our minds are incredibly important. You can train your mind to think in particular ways, you know, develop new neural pathways in your brain. Uh, lots of things that are outside the scope of the sermon, but I already geeked out on learning that this week uh, and, and in general. The mind is not your spirit, but it's inseparable from your spirit. The, your mind uh, and your spirit can be separated from the body, but as we look at Scripture, that's a, that's a grievous thing. And spirits and minds that are separated from the body long for their body, and it's the hope of the resurrection where the body, mind, and spirit are together again. So you can have a spiritless body, but not a mindless spirit. Uh, the mind has to do with the will, with creativity, with learning, with wisdom, with understanding, discovery, thinking, and reason. And, and so when we're talking about meditating, we're talking about one or multiple aspects of those things. Wisdom, creativity, learning, knowledge, understanding, discovery, or the will. And we're talking about loving the Lord our God with all of our mind. We're talking about those elements as well. So thinking is such a core part of what makes you you. It really is. What you'll do, who you'll become, the trajectory of your life, it's no wonder that Jesus includes it in his command to love the Lord your God. R.C. Sproul, he says, nothing can be in the heart that's not first in the mind. If we want to have an experience of God directly, where we bypass the mind, it's a fool's errand. It can't happen. We might increase emotion, entertainment or excitement, but we're not going to increase the love of God because we can't love what we don't know. A mindless Christianity is no Christianity at all. I remember maybe 15 years ago, there's a very popular song going around Christian circles that contained a lyric along the lines of, <clears throat> help me to not think so much. I just want to, kind of be, I want to be here with you. You're like, shut off the mind. Let's just engage the feeling or the emotion. And what Sproul rightly identifies is that is a fool's errand. We need the mind. The mind is active, engaged in our worship, all aspects of our worship and our life. So our scripture speaks about the mind a lot. Like we looked at a couple weeks ago from Colossians, set your minds on the things that are above. Or Romans 8, for those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it doesn't submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And famously, Romans 12, where Paul writes, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, because of what we know about God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Don't be conformed to this age, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to discern what is the good, pleasing and perfect will of God. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. So you can't love God with, a, with an untransformed mind, just like you can't love God with an unregenerate heart. We can learn about Him, gain knowledge about Him, but to love Him, we need new thinking that comes from Him. To the Ephesian church, Paul writes, I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer walk as the Gentiles do. How did they walk? In the futility of their thoughts. They're darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance that's in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. And he goes on and he says, that's not how you came to know Christ, assuming you heard him rightly, and were taught by him as a truth in Jesus to take off your former way of life, your futile thinking, the old self that's corrupted by deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity and truth. 
So hear how Paul is keen for his disciples, for the church to operate out of truth, not out of ignorance, not out of foolishness or futile thinking. His, his key is, the difference is the renewed mind. Something about the mind. Obviously, we talk about the regenerate heart a lot. And Paul also emphasises this renewed mind. The old self is gone. The new self is on. The new self concerned with truth. Truth that doesn't terminate at knowledge. It's not satisfied by just knowing, but a knowledge that leads to worship, that leads to a life lived for God. It's doctrine that leads to devotion. It's truth that leads to worship. Not just facts, but knowledge that turns into adoration. So it's not an adoration that abandons knowledge, that jettisons the mind, goes, I'm just going to, just going to fill with the heart and adore, but it is a renewed mind, a renewed heart that worships God in spirit and in truth. Piper wrote, uh, there are several components to this, to the intellectual love of God, to the renewed mind love of God. Firstly, there's dedicating our minds to knowing Him. Secondly, thinking clearly and truly about Him so we don't have false ideas in our minds, so we don't have a false picture of God that we're worshipping. We actually, we need to think rightly. In fact, this, the word repentance, uh, you may have heard, denotes a, I was heading this way and now I have done a 180 and I'm heading this way. Uh, and I'm more, to more fully understand the word repentance, it actually uh, it denotes conforming to the mind of God. To actually thinking his thoughts, to thinking like him. And thirdly, it says, not being satisfied with a mere intellectual awareness of his attributes, character, and acts, but intentionally devoting that mental effort to serve the affections for God. So he's saying, the person doesn't move from an intellectual awareness of God, like, wow, God is massive, amazing, mighty, to then expressing that, then we haven't actually gotten to worship. We don't want to just stay in the intellectual and we don't want to jettison the intellectual and just be in the emotional. We want doctrine that leads to devotion. We want a renewed mind that leads to a regenerate heart glorying in the glory of God. Meaning if we want to worship better, more rightly, more worshipfully, more spiritually, more truthfully, more how God desires and deserves, we need to activate our minds in worship. By knowing greater truths more greatly. Like John Masiemi said, in order to heighten our worship, we must deepen our theology. So how do we do that? Where does meditation come in? Man, I love this. Uh, Peter Adams, he said that meditation is luxuriating in God's word. It's luxuriating in God's word. I love it. Which kind of, you get the feel that it's kind of like, it's kind of like lounging in it, being surrounded in it. Or like you're in a pool and just kind of floating. It's totally immersed in this thing that you are luxuriating in. And what Peter Adams says is, we meditate when we luxuriate in God's character, in His word and in His works. So again, it's not emptying the mind. That's not the goal of meditation. Meditation is actually about filling our mind. One of the things I love about the Bible reading plan we're doing this year as a church is <clears throat> there's six days of readings and then one day, the Sundays, are a day for meditating on just one verse or just one thought. And intentionally so that at least once a week we would be spending time meditating on just one thought, one aspect, one characteristic, one work of the saving, satisfying, sovereign God of the universe. My hope is that it's not just once a week, like that we're in the practice of meditating. We meditate on God's word, meditate on his works, meditate on his character, meditate on his son. Let me just quickly break these down. First, meditation on God's word. Psalm 1, his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law. He meditates day and night. 
He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf doesn't wither. In all that he does, he prospers. So what Peter Adams is talking about, like luxuriating in the works of God. Uh, David here is writing about what does meditating on the law do for us when we think about it day and night, when it's consistently or constantly turning over in our minds as we're thinking about the character of God, the works of God, the Word of God, especially here, the law, like the, the Word of God. When I think about it all the time, it says, that person is like a tree that grows its roots right down deep, right next to an everlasting source of nourishment, of life, of strength. doesn't matter what comes. doesn't matter when famine comes, when, um, uh, when uh, what, is, what is it? Let's read it probably. It doesn't matter when... Uh, doesn't even say in this part here. But his leaf doesn't wither. And all he does, he prospers. Everything else turns to windy desert. And this tree planted by the river doesn't just survive, but thrives and bears fruit. By filling our minds with the Word of God, by spending time in the Word of God, that the God of the universe, like the, the being who whispers and billions and billions and trillions of stars and galaxies appear in obedience to His voice. This being who made us, who sustains us with, his, with that same Word. He loves us. He hasn't left us to try to fend for ourselves or figure things out by ourselves, but has given us His Word, both in the written form in our Scriptures and in the physical form in His Son, Jesus. And we want to fill our minds with His Word. We want to know God. So uh, the writer of Hebrews says, this is the covenant I'll make with them after that time, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their hearts I'll write them on their minds. A God-loving mind is full of the Word of God. We meditate on it. We luxuriate in it. We roll it around in our minds. What I, what I like to do in this sense is, is to, like we're doing with our, with our Bible reading plan, pick a verse or a paragraph and just think about that paragraph. I'll, I will put it in places where I can see it I'll come back to it uh, after day, after day, after day, thinking about that one verse. What does it tell me about the work of God? What does it tell me about the character of God? What does it tell me about His work in the world? What does it tell me about me? What does it tell me about the way that I should live my life? And the more I ruminate on it, the more I think about it, the more I dwell in it or luxuriate in it, the more it has its effect on me. Secondly, meditation on God's works. The psalmist again, I will remember the deeds of Yahweh. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I'll ponder on all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. So Christian meditation involves reflecting on God's might of His mighty work in the world, uh, in the world relating to us, in our lives, ourselves, where we recount the evidences of God's grace in our lives. We think about those things. How good is God? How good are His works? How good are His ways? We saw that before with His character, with His Word. We'll see that with His character in a minute. And we see that in His works, how He is operating in the world, how He operated throughout Scripture. And as we think about these things, this type of meditation fills us with gratitude, fills us with awe as we recognise more and more of how God is at work in our lives. When we don't meditate, about the work of God in our lives. We can neglect it. And in fact, we can miss it. And we can start to feel distant from Him because we start to judge His love for us based on our circumstances rather than based on His consistent work in our lives. And so we go, I'm suffering now. Where is God? Or we might say, I asked for this, but I got that. Where is God? We don't meditate on the goodness of God, 
the greatness of God, meditate on his works, we start to forget about his works. We become myopic and focused. In, we start to meditate on what we don't have rather than meditate on what we do have. Thirdly, meditate on God's character. Oh, the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I'll meditate from Psalm 145. Meditating on his character. Man, this is, this is actually one of my favorite ways of meditating. Just think about one of the characteristics of God. Think about, like we did before, his majesty, his creative power, his pure volition. He does whatever he wants to do. I saw one of those, you know, those videos. Uh, Mike come up as you scroll through social media one time and says, you want to know how small the earth is? Uh, here's the earth. And then we zoom out to our solar system and then we zoom out to our galaxy and then we zoom out to our cluster of galaxies and then we zoom out to our cluster of clusters of galaxies and then we zoom out to the known universe and then we think we know beyond what we can see that it is millions of times bigger than that. And as you think about the characteristics just that one characteristic, I meditate on the greatness of God who speaks and it all comes into existence. All of a sudden, all of my problems, all of my circumstances seem very easy for God. And then when I read in Scripture where it says nothing is impossible for God, I think that's right. Nothing is impossible for God because I have this immensely zoomed out view, still totally, wholly inadequate, to, to view him in his grandeur, but at least to a degree that helps me in that meditation to trust in him, to worship him. And that's just one characteristic. What about his love? What about his forgiveness? What about his mercy? What about his holiness? What about his justice? Imagine spending a week or a month daily, hourly, Reminding yourself of his justice. Getting into the scriptures and trying to understand more about his justice. How much more will you understand him? How much more can we worship him? How much more will we want to pursue his kind of justice? Have our minds set on the things that are above when we meditate and gain the mind of Christ in that way. Fourthly, meditate on Jesus. The writer of Hebrews is saying, fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author. He's the perfecter of your faith. Look at him. Fill your mind with him. Become like him. Gain the mind of Christ. Like Think like him. Love like him. Relate to the Father like him. Forgive like him. Love others like him. Like the writer of Corinthians says, we used to view Jesus from a worldly point of view, but we don't do that any longer. And neither do we view each other from a worldly point of view, but we view each other like Jesus views us because we've gained the mind of Christ. Or in Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves. What mind should we have? What mindset should we have? How should we set our thinking? Which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. So as we look to Jesus, we see him, again, more in, in his godly characteristics, but we also become more like him because we love what he loves and we hate what he hates and we pursue what he would have us pursue and we view one another how he views us and we relate to the Father how he relates to the Father because we've been adopted as the Father's sons and daughters in him. We are in him. So fix our eyes on him. And what does this do? It, do? it fulfills that Romans 12 command to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That our minds are renewed as we don't empty them, but rather we fill them with scripture. We fill them with ruminating and luxuriating in the character of God as we fill our minds with the works of God, how he's been at work, how he is at work, how he promises to work in the future. And then by testing, 
we may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect with our new minds. I don't know, I don't, I'm not saying we do this perfectly, but we do this to the degree that we gain the mind of Christ. And one of the spiritual disciplines that leads us there is that we would meditate on God, on his works, on his word, on his character, and on his son. Like I mentioned before, this is one of the reasons it's so important to watch what you sing. Because when you sing, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're both speaking and you're hearing, your mind is engaged, your faculties are engaged, your emotions often are engaged. And so we're almost preaching to ourselves when we sing. And we're preaching to ourselves when we speak. And our self-talk as well is also meditation. And we want to do the work of, like Paul writes, to take every thought captive and subject it to Jesus. Everything, no thought flows freely, uncritiqued, unchallenged, all of them. We take captive of every thought and then subject every thought to Jesus. Lest we begin meditating on the things that will take us away from Him, that will distract us from Him, or will paint an incorrect, like an untruthful picture of who He is in our mind. Maybe the, the worst of them all is that. We start worshipping and following a God that doesn't exist. We need to be meditators. Meditation is about renewing our minds, helping us discern God's will, live in alignment with Him as we become more like Him. And so in our discipleship groups, we're going to talk about, in fact, some of your discipleship groups aren't back yet, but when we get back in our DGs, we're going to be talking about meditation. How do we do this? How do we do this well? How do we do this? Because there's a, if you just Google, how do I meditate? You're going to come across a lot of unhelpful ways to meditate. The emptying of your mind or you're focusing on other things. We want to fill our mind with, again, the work, the word and the character of Jesus. So we'll do some of that work in our discipleship groups. Uh, if you're visiting with us, man, you're welcome to come join one of those DGs. Uh, or if you just want some, I don't know, I loathe to say tips, but some uh, strategies on how to implement meditation in your life, come speak with me afterwards. Uh, for now, let's pray. And so Father, I want to thank you for these scriptures. Thank you for helping us to understand how we can understand Father, that's our hope, is that we would gain the mind of Jesus. Think like Him, love like Him, forgive like Him, relate with you and the world like He does, to the degree that we can. And so help us in every way to have our minds filled with meditation of your character, of who you are. We don't just want to know stuff about you, we want to know you, know you well, know you more know you truthfully, who you really are, to know, to fill our minds and know more of your works, what you've done, what you're doing, what you're doing in us, how you're active in the world even now, and that we have a greater confidence and assurance in the promises of how you're going to work in the future. Father of your word, your scriptures, have spoken to us already, that our minds be filled with your word and filled filled with the likeness of Jesus, who He is, what He's done, what that means. So help us, Father, in every way to have renewed minds so that we can discern what is your good and perfect and pleasing will. Because we want to worship you well. We want to have a renewed mind, a regenerated heart that leads to adoration, devotion, worship, praise, honour, Glory to you. We pray this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen.